stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets are glad the bombs bursting in there week. <laughs> it's a very funny thing. It's a very funny thing when uh, Eve enrolled in my, in my undergraduate Vietnam course, she sat up in the front row. Uh, by the third day, every guy who was in the back row was also <laughs> sitting in the front row, and it was the first and only course I've ever had with the guys all up front. <laughs> anyway. Um, Ambassador Colby, Ambassador Line, Ambassador Passage, Representative Duncan, Admiral Zumwalt, Vice Admiral Tidd, Rear Admiral Price, Lieutenant Generals Cushman, Mittemeyer, and Palmer. How do I get Rear Admiral Price in front of you guys? I'm sorry. Um, Brigadier General Metaxas, President Harrigan, distinguished academics, fellow veterans, of the war, citizens of Lubbock. That's, uh, pardon me? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, I forgot you, pardon me. <laughs> there are so many dignitaries here, we couldn't have a front table. The table would have gone, uh, General Khan is here? General Khan. Some pretensions about the study of Vietnam. At that time, and at this meeting, I outlined my vision for the Vietnam Project at Texas Tech. I don't need to repeat it here. So many of you, uh, thank God, came back again after the first visit, and uh, so you know what I'm talking about. Now I'm pleased and honored to tell you that with Admiral Zumwalt's help, with the support, the gracious support of the university, with the financial support of the state of Texas, and let me add, with the very hard work of the men and women of the Center for this, uh, the Vietnam Center Advisory Board, we have now begun to realize that vision. In the three years since last you were here, uh, the infrastructure that will support our center and our archive have now become a reality. Saturday, those of you who are staying with us until Saturday will have an opportunity to see those magnificent buildings, unfortunately not yet completely finished, we had hoped you'd be, uh, we'd be conducting this conference in one of them. Nevertheless, they are there. I'd like at this point to recognize the members of the Vietnam Center Advisory Board who are with us tonight. And uh, would you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please stand up. These Men and women are the silent partners in this project. They do all the work. I get all the uh, kudos, and I want to make sure that you know our board is comprised uh, of citizens from the community, veterans ranging in rank from former private to lieutenant general. We meet regularly. We chart the course of this project, and they give me uh, sometimes surprising advice, and I follow it. And we were, sometimes, I never thought they were going to say what they said. Uh, but, you know, we, I go along and I do what uh, the board directs. And so we have kept this project firmly rooted in the community where it belongs because Vietnam is still so emotionally tied to the community that it cannot and will not be purely academic. 
now, although the board is not academic, the conferences that we host are. And so we are here uh, to encourage academic study, to encourage the young men and women who are interested in learning more about Vietnam to realize uh, that knowledge that they seek. And we are pleased, uh, myself as an academic of course, but the rest of the board just as simply Vietnam veterans to be able to do something positive about our Vietnam experience and what you see in the week you're here and the buildings you'll see and the programs that you'll realize from our newsletters in the years ahead will be a reflection of the effort of plain American patriots and citizens seeking to provide knowledge to the next generation of those terrible events, those tumultuous years, those victories that we had, those defeats we suffered and so that we can make sure that future generations have the wherewithal to study and to understand and to, to define and answer the questions of future generations will ra raise about these events which we all know uh, so very intimately. And we're so pleased and so honored that so many of the honored men and women who led our nation who made the big decisions of the war are here tonight, who are, are part of this project and are willing to share their experiences with that younger generation. It's a vital thing that they provide their knowledge to our students because before too long all of us who were there will be gone and those students, that generation, then at least will have some knowledge of us will be able in their own studies and teaching in the years ahead to pass that on to yet another generation. And so uh, this experience, uh, the valiant efforts, uh, the heartbreaks, and all the rest that went with, went with Vietnam will be preserved and transmitted on. And with our uh, other effort, other side of our effort, the Vietnam Archive, the documentary record also will be preserved. I'm honored and pleased to tell you uh, the Texas Tech University and with the President, uh, sorry, President Harrigan sitting here uh, has made uh, a longer than lifetime uh, commitment to this project. Uh, I can't plan much further than that. I've planned that far, but I can't plan any further than that. The records of the Vietnam War, of the, of the private citizens, of the generals, the admirals, the diplomats are safe in our hands. They will be preserved. They will be ready uh, for citizens a hundred years from now as they seek to answer their own questions about the 1960s and the 1970s. And I can't think of a more noble thing uh, for us, to, uh, we who served, uh, it to do. And I know that all the members of our board share that dedication. We met first in May of 1989, and I can tell you uh, that virtually every person who was at that first meeting is still an active uh, member of the board, with one exception, our dear, dear friend, Marshall Harrison, who passed away, as you know from our newsletter, of a heart attack in August of last year. Well, I had some notes here I was going to talk about, but I seem to have gotten wound up. Um, goodness gracious. Uh, in my classes on the Vietnam War, every now and then I have to stop and check my pulse. That's why I know that I'm not a completely unbiased observer of this. That'll have to wait for the next generation. Much work remains. Thank you very much. I know in a few of the sessions other people were checking their pulses today. Uh, <laughs> It's amazing how close to the surface the emotions that are associated with our, the Vietnam experience remain 21 years after those tanks broke that fence down in front of uh, uh, the presidential palace uh, at the end of that road we all remember so well in downtown Saigon. Much work remains to be done. I can tell you that everyone here at Texas Tech will continue to rise to the challenge of providing academics today and for the, the years and decades to come with the best possible research facility. 
uh, when you tour the new archive and see uh, the reading room which our researchers will be using with its cathedral-like qualities, light shining in from beautiful uh, cathedral-like windows. Uh, I know you all have been in some pretty horrendous research rooms. This will be the finest one that you'll ever see. Uh, and when next time we meet in April of next year in the new International Cultural Center, for which I might add Dr. Idris Trailer, who is somewhere here in the, off, in, the, in the audience, has just spent a quarter of a million dollars for the latest uh, high-tech audiovisual aids, you will find the most wonderful, highest state-of-the-art meeting facility anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, here in Texas Tech. And I can tell you, I'm damn proud of it. <laughs> oh, excuse me, ladies. I'm gosh darn proud of it. In Vietnam, we use some other words. I can't remember them anymore because I'm now an academic. <laughs> Not quite politically correct, though, I have to tell you. At any rate, we will continue to meet this challenge, and we, will, and we plan to continue to develop our conference program, to provide the most intellectual, the most uh, challenging and rewarding uh, venue for this intellectual exchange of ideas about this complex and perplexing and demanding uh, subject that we all study and that we all work so hard to understand. And after all these years, I have finally reached uh, a level of understanding. I now know that I don't know a damn thing about it. And uh, I guess the further I get, the, less I'll, or the more I'll appreciate how little it is that I know. And uh, I hope that uh, maybe somewhere along the course, uh, Ambassador Ziem or many of the other uh, uh, very well accomplished uh, individuals here will, will finally clue me in. And so uh, I want to uh, leave that, uh, point, uh, that note at this point and introduce to you the Associate Director of the Vietnam Center, uh, Dr. Don Walker. Uh, Don uh, is a professor of history along with me. Uh, we've really infiltrated that place. Uh, Don spent three years in Vietnam as a State Department provincial advisor in i -Corps. Uh, so he also has just a little bit of hands-on experience. And uh, so I will introduce Don Walker so that he can introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Thank you very much. Oops. I've got to give you this. That's very strange. You can handle it. Which one do you stand on? Whichever you want. I don't usually grab guys by their belts. I was going to say, this is, this is getting awfully intimate here. But I can't make this thing work. I think I need to step down is what I need to do. Well, never mind. Thank you, Jim. It's indeed a privilege to be able to, to speak about Ambassador Colby this evening, a man whom I consider to be one of the true heroes of the American Cold War effort. Ambassador Colby's public career extends back to World War II when he joined OSS, uh, initially parachuting behind enemy lines, earning the nickname Wild Bill Colby, a name that he retains. 1950, he joined the Central Intelligence Agency, and his initial postings were in various places in Western Europe, but in 1959, he became Saigon Bureau Chief for Central Intelligence, where he was a valuable advisor to Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. Following the Tet Offensive, he, he returned to Washington, but following the Tet Offensive, he returned to Vietnam, this time committed to what, we later, what would later become known as the Pacification Program. He remained in that position until 1973, when he became Director of Central Intelligence, a position he held until 1976. And his, one of his later achievements, but I'm sure one that compares with any of his previous ones, came just a few short years ago when he, he became a member of our National Council for the Center for the Study of the Vietnam Conflict at Texas Tech, and we do appreciate that, Mr. Colby. I first met Ambassador Colby in the spring of 1970, when I was one of about five or six young Foreign Service Reserve officers arrived in Vietnam just before going up country 
We were told one afternoon that at 10 o'clock the next morning, we were expected to be in Ambassador Colby's office for coffee. And we were all very apprehensive. Just before leaving Washington, we'd had coffee with Ambassador Comer, <laughs> who was known as Blowtorch, and as far as I could tell, richly deserved that appellation. <laughs> we were apprehensive. We go into Colby's office, and instead of finding someone like Blowtorch, we found this very mild-mannered, very gentle-spoken man who was nonetheless very, very enthusiastic and managed to instill in each one of us an enthusiasm for what we were going to do. He convinced us that what we were going to do was the very most important part of this war. The fate of the free world hung on our efforts. And we believed it. And we believed we could, we could do what he asked us to do. A few days later, we, we went up country to our assignments, and we were so low ranking, they didn't know whether to hand us a, hand us a broom or a pencil. We didn't find the enthusiasm up there. But we stayed with it. We did what we could. I left Vietnam in 1972, returned to the United States. I followed Ambassador Colby's career. I remember seeing, as I'm sure most of you did, those pictures in 1974 of him sitting there in the Oval Office with President Ford, the other advisors, as they're receiving the grim news of what's happening in Vietnam, spring of 75, Saigon Falls. And it just all sorts of memories raced back through my mind of the work we'd done, the things we tried to do. And I remember being so excited shortly after President Reagan was elected. And I'm not trying to play politics here, but I do remember one of the comments President Reagan made that was so meaningful to me. And I don't remember his precise words, but it was something to the effect of, I find it impossible to look back at the misery the Vietnamese people have gone through since 1975 and say that what we did there was not worth trying to do. And I remain fully committed to that. And this is one of the reasons that, I've, that I find this work with the center to be so rewarding, which brings us to the point of how Mr. Colby agreed to join the center. In the fall of 1989, Jim Rector went, went before the Texas Tech Board of Regents and asked for permission to establish a center. And the word I got from Jim later was they were very enthusiastic. We wish you all the luck in the world, but we don't have any money. So shortly after that, he came to my office, knowing I'd been in Vietnam, and said, would you like to help? And I said, well, sure, I'd love to work with this. He said, okay, we've got to have some money. We've got to raise money. I didn't know anything about raising money, and he, I think he knew about as much as I did, maybe a little more. But it occurred to us that one of the ways you raise money is to find some people who are famous and get them to help you. So I said, okay, a little silence. He said, I know Admiral Zumwalt. I used to work for him in Vietnam. I could ask him, who do you know? I said, well, I met Colby once. <laughs> he won't remember me, but he might remember what I did, the team I worked with. So we agreed. Jim got in touch with Admiral Zumwalt, he agreed. About a week after we talked, I went to my office, and I said, well, I'm going to try to get in touch with Mr. Kobe. I don't know where he is. I assume he's in Washington. So I called Washington, D.C. information, asked for William Colby. The phone rang. This delightful woman's voice answered, told her who I was, and I said, um, is Mr. Colby there? And she said, oh, he's out back working on his boat. She said, I think you need to call his office. Apparently, I got the man's home. And I thought, this is really unusual. The former director of Central Intelligence has his number listed in the D.C. directory. <laughs> He's just as I remembered him being, a man without affectation. He came out here for our conference in 93. I escorted him around. And in one of the times that we were driving around, I said, Mr. Ambassador, do you have any papers left that you didn't turn over to CIA or some other government agency when you retired? And he said, oh, I have a few things that I use in writing my book, Lost Victory, but they're, they're boxed away. I don't know where they are. And I said, well, if you don't have any other plans for them, we'd like to have them. This is the kind of thing that, that makes a good archive. He said, okay, well, you know, I'll get around to it sometime, and I'll certainly keep you in mind. Well, we didn't hear anything. I had dreams of having the William Colby collection being one of the initial collections in the Vietnam Center. So about five weeks or six weeks after Ambassador Colby left, I went out to the Yano Estacado Winery. 
and bought a sample of a sampler case of three of their finest wines, the ones that had just won the European awards. Had them all boxed up, put a note inside, and said something to the effect of, we're thinking of you, please think of us. <laughs> And about 10 days later, he calls Jim and says, by the way, those boxes are on the way. <laughs> I'm not trying to suggest that the former director of Central Intelligence can be bought. <laughs> he can, I think, be influenced, particularly with good West Texas wine. So I'll not take up any more of his time, but we'll present to you Ambassador William Colby. <laughs> you bet. Let's see, I've got to get this. I've got to get this on you. How do you get this? Thing? There, we, there we are. There we are. Well, thank you very much, Don, and uh, President Berrigan, and uh, Admiral Zumwalt, all mayor, Mr. Mayor, all the good friends here, uh, General Khan, Ambassador Boisam. Uh, our equal friends. It's a great pleasure to be here in West Texas. Yes, they did get me here with the three bottles of some of the best wine I've had. And <laughs> believe me, I've looked around uh, all over France for it. Uh, and particularly when I was behind the lines, they, they weren't shipping very much around the rest of the world. So uh, I had some pretty good ones there at the time, which we managed to do away with. But uh, it is a great pleasure. We mentioned here earlier today that great gentleman from this region, Congressman Mahon, that I worked with very closely. He was one of the most respected congressmen in all of the Congress, a great gentleman, a great representative of this area, no question about it. So it's always a pleasure to come back and see the great open spaces and the clear air that you have out here, even though you don't have very much water in it this year. <laughs> asked to give a keynote, you sort of wonder, well, what am I going to say about a keynote for a meeting such as this? We've had a bunch of discussions, and pretty lively ones, and good ones, and I think they've been fun for everybody. So at this point, how do you give a keynote? And I thought maybe I could go back on one of our discussions as to whether we're trying to achieve a truth in history, or whether we're trying to achieved the might have beens of history, uh, and neither of those is totally satisfactory, whether we want to achieve the lessons of history. And I decided that really what we want to achieve is the turning points of history, without a precondition that if we'd done it differently, it would have been better or worse. But when were some of the key turning points? Because I think that can be the subject of a conference at which we can all sort of focus on some of those key events of a long period for our country, dealing with another country in that faraway Southeast Asian territory. So I look back on one of those key turning points. Well, I'll dismiss the time that the U.S. Constitution visited Da Nang Bay. That was a long time ago, and I don't think it had much relevance to what happened since. But it did, as you may have known. Certainly the, the Navy people know about it. Uh, and I think modern history and America's relationship with Vietnam can essentially start at the end of World War II, one of the real key turning points. As we heard earlier, the OSS had a team working with Ho Chi Minh. The aid man on the team saved Ho's life by saving him from a severe case of diarrhea at one point. And with that saving of his life, we preserved a man who went on to lead the campaign against us. Uh, I don't think any American is ashamed of saving Ho's life for that reason. It's very American to do that. The OSS team that was there were young officers, enthusiastic, picking up Ho's reference to the American Declaration of Independence and his statement of the Declaration of Independence of Vietnam, uh, saying, well, now wait a minute, this is not bad. It evoked a certain interest from Roosevelt, uh, who said that the French had been in Indochina for a hundred years and the people are worse off than when they got here. Roosevelt's concept was a bit 
maybe we can have a period of tutelage. Was this a turning point? It certainly was. A turning point caused by the death of President Roosevelt. A turning point caused by the rise of the Red Army in Eastern Europe, which attracted President Truman's attention as the most serious problem he faced. If that turning point had gone the, the other way in either of those situations, it could have been a major change. I won't say what the change would be, but it certainly co counts as one of the big turning points. We debated whether Ho Chi Minh was a communist or a nationalist. Obviously, he was both. But would he have been a Tito in Asia? Did we understand the antagonism between the Vietnamese and the Chinese, which has gone on for thousands of years, which was mentioned earlier today, that it would have encouraged the growth of a Titoist approach in Southeast Asia, a turning point of the first regard? Well, then we essentially stayed out of it for a bit while the French and, and Ho fought, fought it out until the French were in serious straits. And the question was whether the United States should go in for direct support of the French in the final days of 1954. Whether the United States should put troops in, whether the United States should use its air power, whether the United States should support with massive military resources directly rather than indirectly through supporting the French army in France. Should we even think and contemplate of using a nuclear weapon? And that was a turning point. It came out that we, President Eisenhower decided no. But it certainly was a turning point, because it would have been very different if it had not gone that way. A subject of considerable interest of looking at how that turning point turned out that way. Moving ahead from there, the next turning point, 1955-56, when a, an untried administrator was chosen to be the prime minister of South Vietnam, No Din Xiem a man who was a son of a Mandarin in the court of Hue. He had been educated as a Catholic. He almost became a priest. Some people called him a monk in any case. Uh, he was named because he had a nationalist record, that he had struggled for the independence of his country against the French. He had refused posts to which the French wanted to assign him because he said, I will not be just a subordinate to French colonialism. Sounded pretty good. So when he was named the prime minister in a last minute hope to save South Vietnam, we began to support him, a turning point of considerable importance, a turning point which said that the United States' refusal to sign the Geneva Agreement of 1954 was followed by a commitment to help this new South Vietnam to, uh, to uh, survive and take on a little direction. A turning point followed the next year when President Xiem took a look at the population and said there are 18 million inhabitants of North Vietnam and only 14 million inhabitants of South Vietnam. No, I will not go ahead with the elect elections called for in the Geneva Accord to unify Vietnam because it's a foreordained answer. It has to become a communist country, a turning point, where it launched off on an independent position. And John Foster Dulles at the time decided that we would throw a large amount of economic assistance into this new struggling South Vietnam, a turning point of considerable magnitude, accompanied by a letter by President Eisenhower asserting his full support of an independent South Vietnam. Then another turning point in 1958, when Le Swan, one of the leaders of North Vietnam, made a trip down to South Vietnam, came back and said, you know, the situation's serious there. This Diem regime seems to be taking off. The whole world had expected South Vietnam to fall in our lap by about two or three years. And instead, the thing seems to be showing some vitality. The government the social programs, the economic aid program, economic growth. We got to do something, fellas, when he got back to Hanoi. And so they decided to start the second Indochina War. And they are quite frank about it at this point. They identify that the reason the Transportation Corps was named the 559 
was it just happened to be the fifth month of, the fifth, of 1959, and that that was why they started the use of the Ho Chi Minh Trail at that time to go back to the People's War that they had so successfully run against the French, a turning point of considerable importance. How did they come to that conclusion? What was the reaction in South Vietnam? What was the reaction in the United States? A major turning point for the Americans, who looked back on the last war they'd fought in Asia, in Korea, and said, you know, we may be faced with a war here in Vietnam, and our last experience was in Korea, so let's prepare to fight it. We fought that one to a draw. That's our national interest, is not to win. We don't want to go to the Yalu again and bring the Chinese in on us. We just want to stop them and maybe divide the country and let the competition between economic and social growth in, in the South compete with communist stagnation in the North. A turning point that we decided, yes, we would support the South Vietnam against this new attack, and yes, we would prepare it for a Korean-style attack a turning point of considerable magnitude. A turning point was reflected, in my mind, the fact that we hadn't read enough about the work, the writings of Ho Chi Minh, Bo Nguyen Jap, and some of the other leaders as to the kind of war they wanted to fight. That they wanted to fight a people's war, and not a Korean war. But we didn't read those. We didn't hoist them aboard, and so we prepared. A major turning point in our experience in Vietnam. 1960, the situation gets a little worse. We begin to send more advisors, more support. We have an argument with the government of Vietnam as to whether that is should, what we should do. Or should we build up the forces, build up the defense of South Vietnam? Or does South Vietnam need a more democratic government? Our ambassador in 1960 said that if there isn't a more of a turn for democracy here. The situation will get worse. So we may have to think about alternate leaders for South Vietnam in a telegram to the Department of State. A major turning point in American thinking that we didn't just support the constituted government. We were thinking if necessary, we'd have to turn to an alternate government. And as early as 1960, we were thinking in those terms. 1961. A few turning points, as some of the CIA people were trying out some experiments in village defense up in the mountain areas and some of the Catholic villages around. I remember a priest in one Delta village commenting to me one time as he was describing the self-defense group he was developing in his little village, that at the last diocese meeting of the priests of his diocese, they were comparing the relative merits of the M16 and the AR-47, the AK-47. I thought a rather strange subject for a discussion among priests at their annual retreat, but nonetheless a fairly practical one at that time. <coughs> but a turning point that we were beginning to develop the, the elements of a strategy, which was then in 1961 taken as another turning point as the government of South Vietnam took it on as one of their major strategies, developed a concept they call the strategic, village, the strategic hamlet, with the idea of developing hamlets that would develop their own defense, their own identity as communities, and that this would not be the imposition of military force on them, but turning to the people to support an effort to defend themselves in that sense. Uh, a turning point that the government accept, adopted that as a major strategy for their program. And in 1962, it seemed to be working, seemed to be moving ahead. As the communists identified in some of their internal statements that this was a very dangerous initiative as far as they were concerned. As some of the communist sympathizers that have, were aware of what was thinking, that 1962 was a time in which the, the year belonged to the government, in one of their phrases a turning point that this seemed to be a turn in the right direction for a change in terms of getting some initiative against the enemy. 1963, of course, a major turning point in the explosion of the, the predecessor of the Ayatollah Khomeini, Tikti Kwang. 
some of the Buddhists there who were upset at the modernizing tendencies of this secularist government and this Catholic government that they wanted to go back to the fundamentals of Buddhist society and do away with this modernist trend. As I say, a predecessor of the Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, it worked. It, they exploit, the, the government handled it badly, a turning point, alleging that it was all communist inspired, which it wasn't, but nonetheless handling it badly, trying to suppress the Buddhists initially, and a turning point in the American attitude. A liberal democratic president faced with the problem of being the main support of a government which aroused such protest from its citizens that its local priests went out and poured gasoline on themselves and burned themselves so that Life magazine could run a color picture on its cover of this horrible event, a turning point in the American psyche about Vietnam. This is too horrible to contemplate in a way, a major turning point. A turning point in the arrival of Cabot Lodge as the new ambassador, preceded by the government's raid on pagodas to try to suppress the Buddhist priests and their protests. Uh, a masterpiece of bad timing by the government to try to put a, face the new ambassador with a fait accompli so that he couldn't give them any more lectures in democracy, the party will, would have been over. A major failure to recognize the character of Cabot Lodge the reaction that he would have when he, when he ran into this attempt to preempt his influence and his, his ability to direct what was happening. And then, of course, the big turning point, the Americans turned hostile to the government of, of uh, No Din Ziem that they had originally supported. They first encouraged a possible coup and then supported a real coup which to overthrow President Ziem. The discussion that, well, we can't win the war with President Siem because of this protest in the country, and therefore let's get some new leadership, a turning point of major importance. I don't, I'm sure the Americans did not contemplate the death of Siem, but one of the fascinating things for one who went through the arguments all that summer about whether to sink or swim with No Dien Siem was that I didn't, don't remember one serious discussion in all that time about who would succeed President Siem as the leader of Vietnam. The communists viewed his overthrow as a gift from heaven from us. They have absolutely baffled by how that had happened. Could not understand it a bit. The Americans did not intend his death. It happened and the option of his coming back was then taken away, a turning point. The government at thereafter, various turning points as revolving door governments followed for a couple of years, total chaos and confusion, the abandonment of the strategy of the village efforts by the new government, which after all couldn't take on the major strategy of the predecessor government, and a turning point downwards in 1960 for and 1965. Followed in 19, late 1964 by the decision in North Vietnam to move regular troops down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which again was something we picked out of our airwaves and out of our intelligence sources, but since has been amply confirmed by statements by the North Vietnamese that that is actually when they began to send their major units down for the coup de grace to South Vietnam. A turning point in 1965 when our government was told that undoubtedly South Vietnam will fall by the end of 1965, that that was the fate that is here. We have a new president by then, a major turning point. It's easy to talk about what might have happened with if President, president Kennedy had lived, whether he would have kept up his effort until the 64 elections and then gradually reduced and reduced down to an advisory and special forces operation or whether he would have gone ahead with the same kind of history that Mr. Johnson. It's not very useful to discuss what these options were. There are lots of them. But as a major turning point, it's certainly the death of President Kennedy was a major 
turning point. And then the decision facing President Johnson in the middle of 1965, should we uh, essentially give up or should we send our troops to stabilize the situation? And then the decision in that turning point of, well, let's not face it directly. Let's start some bombing to show our will, to send some messages. And let's send some Marines in to protect the air bases, not to fight, but just to protect the air bases from which our aircraft are going. Now, this was a turning point of a refusal to be frank about what our requirements were, what our need was, and what our decision actually turned out to be. Again, you can fool around with the alternatives, but the fact that that decision, of course, was a major turning point. I happen to think there was another major turning point that year, which has just become visible in recent months, really. And that is Mr. McNamara's decision in 1965, according to his own testimony, that the war could not be won. Flat statement by him. The war could not be won. And yet, Secretary of Defense McNamara remained in office for three more years, sending all those young men out to fight and get killed. I find that the most astounding statement of ministerial irresponsibility I've heard of for many, many years. I don't ask that he join an anti-war movement or protest publicly. He certainly had to get the hell out of that job. No question about it. But that's a turning point. He didn't. Suppose he had. Suppose you would have had an opening of the real debate as to what our strategy should be, what we should do. Instead, we stole along a little bit here, the rolling thunder, we f the first bomb to the 18th parallel and then to the 19th parallel and then to the 20th parallel. And this was all designed to send a message to Ho Chi Minh and his friends. Well, if you want to send a message, why don't you send it in an envelope? Don't use a bomber. <laughs> Use a bomber, you use a bomber to bomb something. That's the whole purpose of it. Don't send the messages. But anyway, that 65 then was a period of that beginning. And that essentially went on in a slow set of escalations until 1967, another turning point. And this was a one that wasn't much perceived at the time except by the people out there. That it seemed that we had finally developed some stability some sense of strategy, that we had a constitutional government after three years of total confusion in South Vietnam. There was a, an elected president, a, a, a national assembly, the elements of constitutional government and stable government. Well, sure, there was military that were doing it, but that was true all over Asia too. And that was nothing surprising. Secondly, that the Americans had organized themselves to conduct a joint civil-military campaign strategy. That we had gotten this rather strange character called Cords put together, thanks to blowtorch, blowtorch Comer. And he was a blowtorch, but it wouldn't have worked if he hadn't been, I'll guarantee you. It was his fire and drive that put over this concept of a civilian service working under a military command conducting a civilian program in conjunction with large numbers of military officers working in it. Cords at its maximum had about 5,000 military and about 1,000 civilians. So you can see the balance. And yet the leadership and the function was not aimed at the enemy. It was aimed at the people to try to encourage the people to identify with their communities, to defend their communities, to give them the means to defend their communities and develop their communities. A turning point in 1967, which so encouraged Ambassador Bunker and General Westmoreland that they came home and said, we have reached a turning point. It really has turned for the better. And they thought so. And I think, in fact, it had. And then the big turning point that we all know about, the Tet Offensive. We can debate about how much we 
anticipated it or not, it doesn't matter. It hit the American public like a, a pail of cold water. And it was a major, turn it was the principal turning point in American opinion toward the war. It crystallized the attitude, this place is too far away, it's too complicated, we don't understand it, we're getting a lot of people killed, and we don't seem to be able to do anything good about it. And that was the start of the real American rejection of the experience. Now, the question as to whether that was a planned result out of the communist attack or whether it was a happenstance result out of a communist attack that wanted to achieve a general uprising and failed miserably is kind of irrelevant because it turned, to be, turned out to be a major turning point. But then the next turning point, 1968-9, the change in our strategy, the development of Mr. Nixon's secret plan. I don't think he had a secret plan, but out of that he developed a plan that made a certain amount of sense. And it, conducted, it consisted of essentially three words. Vietnamization, build the Vietnamese forces so that they can defend themselves with American support with, but without Americans. At the same time, Vietnamization meant gradually reduce, reduce the American forces in the country. Don't abandon it, but on the other hand, no more, and certainly <clears throat> reduce them. That began, Vietnamization, a several year program. Pacification, go at the countryside is a major element of our strategy. To organize the countryside, to build up the villages so that they can defend themselves and develop themselves. No, don't worry about the enemy in that part of the pro program. Just build up the defenses. Use this tactical defense in a strategic offensive with the oil spot spreading the defense more and more. Until you don't kill the enemy, you recruit him into the community. So he plays a role in the community. And the third element of the strategy turned out to be negotiation. Serious negotiations, starting secret negotiations with Henry Kissinger, sneaking in and out of Paris and so forth, beginning to talk with the North Vietnamese about how, the, how can we settle this darn thing, and getting the, the lies and the baloney passed back once in a while, but keeping at it. And those three programs going on for the next several years. And the next turning point, in my mind, is the year 1972. In 1972, when the Vietnamization program has pretty well run its course, where the Vietnamese army has been armed and trained and strengthened to do the job that it should do of defending its country, army and navy, excuse me, Admiral, I mean the military, the pacification program has essentially eliminated the guerrilla problem in most of the countryside, and particularly the rich breadbasket of the Delta in the South. And the negotiations are coming to some kind of a near conclusion. And the North Vietnamese decide that the things are going very badly, that they seem to have lost the people's war, and it's time perhaps to turn to the soldiers' war. So a major soldier's assault at three points on the Vietnamese frontier, at the DMZ, up around Quan Tum, and down around, uh, further south around An Lok. Regular forces come over the border in the most traditional form of Korean attack. Divisions, tanks, armor, motor transport, all the rest. They punch into South Vietnam, and they're stopped. They're stopped by the Vietnamese forces. Yes, some Vietnamese units broke and ran, and we had the usual scandal in the newspapers about that, but essentially that attack stopped. And over the next several months, those attacks were thrown back over the border. A major turning point. The Americans, not involved on the ground as troops. No, no Americans involved as combat units at that point. American contribution, yes, a major one in the major logistics. Because if you train a foreign army to use American weapons and American tactics, you have to give them American logistics or it isn't going to work. And they were given that logistic in massive amounts. 
and it did work. And American air power, which was used very generously from the Navy and the B-52s, and which finally had real targets in military units and tanks and artillery and things like that. And that assault across the frontier was thrown back in each of the three areas. Over the, it took another couple of months to throw it back up in Quang Tri, but it essentially was thrown back. A major turning point. I called it victory, because if our national objective was a Viet South Vietnam that could, could, could defend itself with American support and air power, but not American fighting on the ground, then I thought that was our national objective. It had been our national objective all along, and it seemed to work. It worked so much that we went on to finish the last of the three strategies, the negotiation. And we had some very stiff negotiations over the next several months, and some negotiations as stiff with the South Vietnamese government as they were with the enemy. No question about it. And we punctuated the final elements of that negotiation with what Mr. Nixon referred to later as the kind of bombing that he should have done in 1969 rather than waiting for 1972 in a, an interview by David Frost. So here was, we reached an agreement. The South Vietnamese, after complaining about it, were forced to sign it, no question about it. They had doubts about it, didn't think it would really work. We said we would sh be sure it would work. Our president gave President Chu a signed letter that said, if you don't sign this treaty, we are not going to support South Vietnam anymore. But if you sign this treaty, we guarantee you that if the North Vietnamese do not comply with it, the United States will react with full force, and that's a direct quote by Mr. Nixon to President Chu. So it looked like we were home free. Our prisoners, our prisoners came home to be met with a great appreciation for their sacrifice for our country and their fine discipline and morale during a miserable period they spent there. We considered that we had reached an honorable end of the war and that it now was indeed over. That, uh, that in that sense, all we had to do was to make sure that the final agreement was actually complied with. And then the South Vietnamese had a real chance to be able to launch the kind of economic and social development that we've seen the results of in places like Korea and Taiwan, and outdistance the North in a matter of five or 10 years in a breathtaking course of development as one of the Asian tigers that we've since called them. Looked pretty good. And then, of course, we had a bit of a problem. We had a Congress elected in 1972 that was fed with the war, fed up to the teeth with it. We had a president who broke down over Watergate. We had a Congress that was so insistent that we not get into military adventures that they passed the War Powers Act that the president could not use our military forces without a very complicated process involving a pro potential congressional veto. And the North Vietnamese looked at that, and then they came, of course, eventually to another turning point in the spring of 1975. And they cranked up another formal military attack at almost the same three points. We were unable to pass the legislation, despite our entreaties of the Congress, to provide the logistic support that we had promised. President Ford had no chance of, com of fulfilling President Nixon's promise to President Q, but both because of the War Powers Act and because of the weakened presidency after Watergate. And so that attack started, and with the lack of any assurance of American support, not participation, but support, the South Vietnamese forces collapsed in almost exactly the same way the French forces collapsed in 1940 and just disappeared. This was a turning point. It wasn't the last one, though, because we've had turning points since then. We had the turning point of how we handled the refugees from Vietnam, how we've handled 
the refugees from Laos. We've had the turning point of how we handle the, the abominations of the Khmer Rouge. We've had the turning point of the, the way that we have gradually convinced the North Vietnamese that they won the war and lost the peace. They've watched the Chinese example and decided, well, maybe they better open their economy if they're not going to be left a million miles behind the, the rest of Asia and their colleagues. And we've had the turning point of their gradually opening toward a decent relationship with Asia and a membership in ASEAN. They still are a very Mandarin-run society by the Communist Party members who are as draconian today as they were all along. We did manage to get many of the people who worked with us in Vietnam out, not just the 130,000 at the time of the fall of Vietnam, but the 200,000 in the orderly departure since that time, coming out by airplane instead of on leaky boats. We had the, the problems of handling the great refugee flow in the leaky boats, and it isn't perfect but the million or so Vietnamese in our country have now, can now testify to the fact that our country did receive them and, and is now benefiting from the fact that their children seem to be winning all the valedictorian awards in our schools. <laughs> so here were the turning points that led to this. And I think as a keynote, I would just offer this list and ask us to look at each of these turning points, ask for these graduate students to see why we made these decisions, why we made some of these, what were the implications, what were the alternatives that faced the decision makers at the time? Were these sensible decisions? Were they wrong decisions? I think that's the sort of thing that our study of this history can re result. And I'm delighted that here in West Texas, it's almost in the middle of the country, uh, so it's convenient to everybody. It's not in that effete, it's not in that effete east which wants to forget the, the whole Vietnam experience. It's out here for where real Americans live. And uh, I think we will see some very interesting studies of these various turning points over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And I think we all owe a great debt of gratitude to Jim Reckner for his energy and effort in putting together this center. And I'd like to get to express our appreciation to him. Thank you. Yes, I did it. <laughs> yeah. 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 What I want to know is, is that the first time you've been bugged, sir? <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Colby. Uh, it's always our honor to have you as our guest at Texas Tech, and we've been honored uh, with your continued and lively support of our endeavor here. And that goes for the many members of the National Council. Uh, Ambassador Ziem is here. He's uh, a member. And uh, Douglas Pike, uh, not just a member, but a generous donor of his uh, magnificent collection of uh, Vietnam documents uh, to the archive of the Vietnam conflict at Texas Tech. And there are a few others not here with us today, unfortunately. Um, I can only say that uh, what we have achieved, we have achieved because we've developed a team and that that team will continue working. We have a goal, we're gonna get there, and I hope in the years ahead, we will provide for all of you the sort of service that you would expect from the first rate, uh, absolutely first rate research facility uh, that Texas Tech uh, Vietnam area will become. Thank you very much. Now I have one final thing. I'd like uh, Chaplain Russell Carver uh, to stand up and offer a benediction so that we could close uh, this ceremony. Thank you very much. May we pause for a moment to remember those who have fallen 
in battle, our comrades in arms, the, the innocents, and those whose whereabouts are still unknown. Our God, we ask that you would be with us and to receive our gratitude for the blessings that we've enjoyed this evening and of our nation. Father, send us from this place inspired not only with knowledge but with wisdom to help in the decisions that we shall make in the future and bless the efforts that are especially being made here. Be with us and fill us with the holiest of your spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. I hope there's a bus. I hope there are two buses out there, uh, which we ordered to, to get everyone back to the hotel. For those of you with cars, don't rush off in case the buses aren't there. We might need your help.